Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, for joining us uh, for the public webinar, webinar on the Irish Coronavirus Sequencing Consortium. Uh, my name is John Kenny. I'm a senior research officer here in Chagas. Um, I'm part of the consortium. I've been working in microbial or plant or human genomics for the best part of the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and my job tonight is to act as uh, act as your host uh, for the webinar and direct your questions to the to the team of panelists we've we've got available to us. Uh, so briefly, some housekeeping just to uh, to start off. Uh, Professor Paul Cotter, who's the the lead scientist on the the original application, um, he's pre-recorded a presentation for us that'll take about about twenty odd minutes, um, and during that he'll describe the basis of the project. Um, the consortium, the science behind it, uh, and after that we'll open up to, uh, to some questions. If you do want to ask a question, if you check the, the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little Q&A um, tab. If you click on that, uh, it'll open up a box and you can, you can type in your, your questions there. Uh, if you're feeling a little bit shy, uh, there's a little checkbox that uh, allows you to post the question anonymously as well. Um, and what we'll do is we're joined by uh, Maren Egan, our, our comms officer here in, uh, in Moor Park in Chagas. Um, between us, we'll try and um, combine those questions and, and make sure we capture as many of them and, and ask them of the, the panel. The presentation is being recorded. Um, so what we'll do is we'll make the recording uh, available on uh, YouTube afterwards and we'll share that link with the registrants. Um, COVID is a pretty hot topic at the moment for obvious reasons. Uh, we're not in a position to discuss things like individual patient cases. Uh, the aim here is to discuss this project and the science that underpins it. Um, but we can take advantage of the excellent panel we've got available to us afterwards and try to open up some of the conversations around, uh, around the, the virus itself. So by way of introduction, um, uh, Paul Cotter is there. He's uh, a professor here and head, head of the, the Food Biosciences Department at, at Chagask. He's uh, a principal investigator with uh, APC Microbiome Ireland and Vistamil, two SFI uh, centres, um, and a uh, principal investigator with uh, Food for Health Ireland. He coordinates the MASTER project, which is a, an 11 million euro EU funded um, project, uh, which investigates microbiomes and the food chain. He's a molecular microbiologist by trade um, with a particular focus on microbiology of foods and the food chain and humans, as well as antimicrobials. Uh, Paul and the lab team he leads uh, are the recipients of multiple national and international awards. He's authored more than 300 peer reviewed publications. And that's thanks to, uh, to research funding he's received from the likes of the EU Science Foundation Ireland and the uh, Irish Health Research Board, amongst many others. So uh, that's enough of me waffling at the outset. Um, what we'll do is we'll start the presentation. Afterwards, I'll introduce the panel um, and we'll, we'll start with the conversation and the, the question is that. But please do add your questions as we, uh, as we proceed through the evening. And um, I hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Kosher. I'm the head of food biosciences at Chagask, and I am also a principal investigator with the Science Foundation Ireland research centers that are known as APC Microbiome Ireland and Vistamilk. And I'm serving tonight as an ambassador, I guess, for the fantastic group of researchers and clinicians who form the Irish Coronavirus Sequencing Consortium, who are located at a number of different hospital labs uh, and research uh, facilities right across the country. And I look forward over to the next 20 minutes or so to telling you more about what we are doing, uh, why it's important and how it will contribute to our understanding of, of COVID and hopefully to understanding how it, it spreads and, and how we might be able to control it in the future. So you've obviously all heard an awful lot about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is responsible for COVID in recent months. Its particular characteristics are that it's a single-stranded RNA virus. And that's notable because the majority of organisms around the world on Earth are, have DNA as their genetic material. 
The only exception are certain types of viruses, which are RNA viruses. So they have a different type of genetic material. And in the case of coronavirus, this genetic material, as indicated by this image here, is surrounded um, by a number of different proteins on its surface, four proteins in particular, including a spike protein. And this is the region which binds to human cells and allows the virus to enter into those cells and burst them open, having reproduced and created lots of other viruses that are capable of spreading further. A number of the other viruses that are present on the surface contribute to providing some level of protection against the immune system. So our focus in terms of sequencing relates to this genetic material that's present on the inside of the cell. So if you consider that genetic material as being individual letters, there are 30,000 such letters or 30,000 RNA nucleotides present within the cell. These, when they are put together in different chunks, are converted into 10 different genes or words. And these words are then in turn converted to 29 different sentences. And within, obviously within every book, there will be in different chapters. And you could regard all of these proteins which are on the surface of the cell as being uh, an important key chapter in terms of their contribution to causing infection and providing protection against the immune system. Now, among the number of viruses that are RNA viruses, you have, in addition to SARS-CoV-2, you have other coronaviruses, such as the common cold, that which causes the common cold, HIV, the cause of the virus for, of, of AIDS, and influenza. And all of these RNA viruses, by their very nature, undergo mutations. And that is just a natural phenomenon which occurs in RNA viruses. And you could regard those mutations as typos within our various different uh, sentences. So to take advantage of that, uh, that analogy, I'm going to use the a particular sentence. The, the cat is in the room as an example. So this is a particular gene or particular stretch of nucleotides present in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, for example. And I want you to imagine that a virus uh, mutation has occurred whereby the capital A is now converted into a small a. And so the sentence has changed subtly, but it's not really any big deal. And so this is a situation whereby you have the original virus that has, uh, was present in Wuhan, and a similar mutation has occurred in perhaps another part of China, and there's a subtle change, but it makes no difference to, to the virus. It is still useful, though, in terms of telling us that this virus is uh, slightly different from the other. A second example is one whereby a mutation has occurred which dramatically changes the meaning of the sentence. So this typo has con inverted an X for um, have you imagine. And so as a consequence of the sentence being mis messed up, the virus becomes less harmful and therefore is less able to either cause infection or to make people ill. And it's taught that such a, a mutation contributed to the fact that the previous SARS virus, which was in circulation quite a number of years ago, um, eventually died out. A mutation occurred that caused it to be less dangerous. Now, a final third example is one whereby the sentence is changed and it dramatically changes the meaning of the sentence in an undesirable way. So to tell somebody that there is a cat in their room is not so big a deal, but that person might not like to hear that the rat is in the room. And this is the analogy that I'm using to convey the possibility of a, a mutation occurring that may make the virus more harmful. So in all cases, these are different strains or different types of the virus. And the fact that the sentence differs allows us to track the way the virus is moving around the world but we are also in particularly interested in trying to identify any changes that might make the virus more harmful or that might make particular therapies or um, new vaccines less effective against it. And each one of these mutations or different letters refers to a different strain or a different strain type. Now, a standard SARS-CoV-2 virus accumulates quite few, only two single letter mutations per month. And that, if you equate it or compare it with other RNA viruses, is about half of that which happens for influenza normally, and about one quarter that occurs for HIV. 
However, because there have been, there are so much of this virus in the world and has spread to so many different individuals, there has been a lot of opportunity for those mutations to accumulate. And in total, there are more than 12,000 known mutations. The majority of them do very little of anything, and but are useful for tracing, and others are of greater interest or, or of particular concern because of particular patterns that have been identified. And one such example here relates to a litter or a typo mutation that began to emerge in uh, March and was identified in April. And this is a change known as the D614G change. And it's a change from a letter D to a G in a particular protein, the spike protein. And this mutation increased considerably over a short period of time. So prior to March the 1st, this version of the virus was only really found in Italy and not so much in China, Australia or in the US. However, quite rapidly after that period, the, this virus began to spread such that it became very much the dominant virus right around the globe. Now, this is just one particular mutation. All of these different viruses had other mutations occurring on top of that at the same time. But at this one particular location within the virus, this change from a D to a G occurred quite dramatically over this period from February, March, April, such that into May, we got to the point where very few of the original D or Wuhan type virus were left. And this new version that had occurred um, was, was very much the dominant one. Now, a lot of the studies that have taken place with those different forms of the virus have occurred in the laboratory rather than studies of, of occurrence in individuals. But the evidence that has accumulated to date suggests that the virus doesn't cause any more dramatic symptoms or make people any more ill, but that it is more effective in causing infection. So it has a, a higher infection rate, and, and that obviously is a, is a concern. So I think I've already presented some examples which highlight why it would be important to do strain typing or, or to trace different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And here in some graphs, you see different patterns. This is different forms of different ways of looking at virus typing. And so different patterns over time of certain strains diminishing and others increasing over time, others staying quite stable. And there's different ways of doing this sort of analysis, hence these different patterns here. But by doing this sort of analysis, we can track chains and changes and map how the virus spreads across regions. In our case, determine how the virus entered into Ireland initially, for example, and how different forms of it are being introduced from uh, different parts of the world, perhaps. It can support efforts to respond to clusters of infection. So we will see more subtle changes within Ireland. But if you have an instance of the identical virus being found in a number of different individuals, then that suggests a common source. And this will help in tracing the virus and helping that, that common source and, and stopping further spread. Collecting the sequences of the viruses in Ireland will also mean we can pick up on important new changes that might affect the ability of the virus to cause disease, such as the, the D and G, the D to G change they mentioned on the previous slide. Or we also want to map it to in that when we hopefully continue to develop better treatments or new vaccines, we want to make sure that those vaccines work against all strains and not just particular types. So and it's important to know that. So we have a consortium of scientists and clinicians in place to meet those um, these particular needs, but also by virtue of putting our, our heads together and working together, we are now present and, and up and running and available if, it's, if this type of sequencing is needed on a greater scale due to um, further outbreaks of COVID in, in the future, or also in the event of different pandemics occurring in, in years to come, which hopefully will not be the case, but I think we're all a little bit better pre prepared for that based on our experiences from the, re from the last few months. So in order to fully understand how we're doing the strain typing, it's first necessary to have a, a general understanding of how standard SARS-CoV-2 or COVID testing occurs. So as you know, this involves a nasal swab and the nasopharyngeal material is introduced into a, a tube with containing lysis buffer. And this lysis buffer causes the um, virus to burst open and release its RNA, which is the material that we want to get at. 
Now we don't want all of this other protein material in there which uh, messes things up so we carry out the purification and then this RNA needs to be converted to DNA because the different tools that we use for analyzing nucleic acid typically focus on DNA rather than RNA. So we convert RNA into what's known as cDNA or complementary DNA and then analyze it through an approach called PCR or polymerized, polymerized chain reaction or more specifically quantitative PCR which allows you to detect and quantify the amount of virus that's present. I'd also, you might be also interested to know that this, um, the buffer that's responsible for the lysis of this RNA is also the buffer that was quite limiting in the earlier stages of the outbreak and which limited the ability of different labs to carry out high levels of testing. Um, but ultimately the, the various different companies that produce lysis buffer have reacted and have been able to mass produce that buffer such that that is no longer a limiting factor. Coming back to our original test or our qPCR test, you get an output that looks like this. If an individual is positive, you have a graph generated that follows this pattern. If a person is negative, a different pattern. So the test works on the basis of finding gene sequences or, or words to come back to our book analogy in a sample. So it is a yes or no test. So if it'll test if a virus is present, but not which strain. And you will have, there are actually quite a number of different qPCR assays out there that are designed to, to bind to different genes within the SARS-CoV-2 um, genome. As I mentioned earlier, the lysis buffer was the limiting factor previously, but now that's available on a much larger scale. So reading all of the letters present within the whole book of the whole virus is necessary to tell what strain is present. So that's more than just the, the standard yes, no question and answer. And then this involves a different type of analysis that we refer to as DNA sequencing. So for DNA sequencing, what we do is we take some of the material that has generated in the hospital lab or in the, the National Virus Reference Lab. So some of this cDNA that's left over, and we can take it and put it into a DNA sequencer and analyze it. So this cDNA is run on either a, a minion instrument or a gridion instrument. And these are technologies that have been developed by Oxford Nanopore Technologies. And in fact, this, this technology is a really neat one in that it's a handheld device. It can be used in, in um, almost anywhere in, in the world because all you need to have is the, the, the cDNA, the sequencer, and a laptop in order to do your analysis. And we've picked this particular technology because of its speed, so it generates um, sequence very rapidly. It is a relatively cheap type of equipment. So we at Chalgus got involved in this whole consortium because we have a, a number of different DNA sequencers, some that generate huge amounts of data but take very many days to carry out the analysis. This alternatively generates a smaller amount of data but we don't need very much data because viruses are, virus sequences are quite small. And they're, because they're so cheap, they're present in very many different labs around the country, both in, in academic labs and in hospital labs. So the beauty of taking this approach is that we can share the workload. We're not dependent on any one lab. The risk of depending on one lab is that if a number of individuals got sick in that lab, then the whole effort uh, could end quite dramatically for some length of time. So by separating and spreading out the effort, that also uh, minimizes the risk of there being um, a major curtailing of the sequencing effort. Now this instrument can be scaled up to a gridiron, so this allows even higher throughput or higher um, generation of DNA sequence data if required. And such a device is present at GMI Genuity in Dublin. And we also have purchased such an instrument in Chagas specifically for this purpose. Now this instrument will be useful for our other research relating to food and agriculture, but we thought it timely um, that Chagas should contribute to this national effort to the, the purchase of this instrument as well. The other beauty of this approach is that we can coordinate the efforts with other countries who are using the same technologies and we're in particularly close interaction with the corresponding coronavirus sequencing consortium that are located in the United Kingdom. And again, it's important to note all of these are very useful for the current situation, 
for future outbreaks of and certain and future waves potentially of of COVID, but are also relevant in instances of other infection in the future. So I'm now going to tell you more about how our Irish Coronavirus Sequencing Consortium um, originated. So we have quite a considerable DNA sequencing facility at our Chagas Research Centre, which has been funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And we use this for Chagas related activities in the food and agriculture research space. But we also make it available to other uh, researchers in uh, academic and, and other institutes around the country. So we were approached by Dr. Patrick Stapleton, who is a consultant microbiologist at uh, University Hospital Limerick. And following discussions with Dr. Fiona Crispy, that lead our sequencing team, and Dr. John Kenny, another research lead in Chagask, uh, we thought that if we were going to do this, it would really be useful to do it in a meaningful way and to do it right across the country rather than just a handful, a small handful of samples. And so this whole initiative really grew legs quite quickly. We were aware that Science Foundation Ireland were making funds available to uh, researchers who could come up with good ideas as how to contribute to knowing more about the coronavirus and um, how it spread and uh, the various different um, aspects of science underpinning the pandemic. Unfortunately, we met a, a fantastic group of different individuals, some of whom we knew previously and others we met for the first time in, in different academic institutes and hospitals who are more than happy to get involved. Now, at the time, very many of the clinicians in, in the hospitals were very busy just um, with the challenges of doing large scale testing. And so we agreed to, to take the lead in terms of putting the consortium together and, and writing the, the proposal, uh, which everybody contributed then. So ultimately, after rigorous peer review, our funding was uh, awarded by Science Foundation Ireland. And ever since then, we've been meeting on a very regular basis through multiple Zoom team meetings among our people who are interested in DNA sequencing and our people who are interested in bioinformatic analysis to streamline the process and make sure that we're all using the exact same approaches and that we're all uh, working and singing off the same hymn sheet. Notably, all of these individuals and their institutes are contributing time at no cost, so we aren't getting no salaries from Science Foundation Ireland. We wanted to make sure that every euro and every cent was used for the consumables that are required for DNA sequencing. For these 2,500 samples that are, are being and are continuing to be analysed from across the country, in order to preserve anonymity, we all we know about those individuals is their gender, their approximate age range and the region of the country they're from. And when I say region, I mean the, the voting constituency in which they are located. So what happens with the data that is being generated or what will it tell us? Well, we have some data already generated from the National Virus Reference Lab that we can use to provide an example. So, but before doing that, I want to introduce you to ways in which this data can be shown. So you're probably used to looking at trees of life. This is a tree of life for different breeds of dog. And you can see certain types of dog that are closely related are all on the same branch. Well, you can do the same as this with, with any species, and we're doing it here with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Again, you see very many different branches and the different colors represent where the virus came from. So a blue color being Africa, uh, a lighter blue, America, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. And the, the Irish uh, sequences, which were generated at the NVRL, um, I've emphasized them here more clearly in red, are located at a number of different branches. So what, that, what does that mean? Well, it means that the Irish sequences, all of these were um, sequences that were from samples collected before June 25th, are from multiple clusters and multiple in dependent introductions. In other words, if we had the same virus that entered into Ireland at the one time and spread everywhere, then all of the viruses would be very similar and they'd all be on the one branch. But instead, we're seeing multiple branches suggesting that the viruses came from multiple different sources um, in that, for example, this virus here is quite similar to lots of viruses that are found from Oceania. Um, other viruses are more similar to ones that came from China. 
And so you can begin to determine where the um, virus is coming from. So the DNA sequencing approach that, uh, that is represented in this graph is continuating. We're uh, getting more and more pieces to this jigsaw and adding more iris sequences to the tree. And the data that would be generated is being put in public databases so that it's not just for our benefit, but can be used by all scientists, both Irish and international, to make sense of what's going on, how the virus is moving through the country, how it's moving across the globe, and indeed anybody that is interested will be able to access this data. Um, but purely the, the virus data, not any personal information from the contributors other than their, their age, gender, and um, general geography. There's lots of other information that I could share with you, but, but time doesn't allow. But I will direct you to this website on the um, that's available through Chiagusk, where you can read very much more about what's going on. Now, most importantly, what's left for me to do is to acknowledge the fantastic effort from very many different people, from Beaumont, CUH, Maynooth, Galway, Trinity, UCC, different parts of UCD, UHL, uh, different centers of Chiagusk, two companies, Genuity and Helixworks, who are contributing by virtue of the fact that they're not interested in viruses per se, but they want to contribute. And because they have the appropriate DNA sequencers, we're willing to do that free of charge and return all of the data for us to analyze then subsequently. A number of different companies who are providing reduced cost reagents, such as Oxford Nanopore, Lab Plan, and Brennan's. And then the very many, many others who have contributed uh, through admin support, helping us to prepare the documents for ethical approval, data protection agreements, and, and very many other aspects. And finally, and, and very importantly, thanks to Science Foundation for, for funding this project. So I leave that that. I thank all of you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the, um, the subsequent discussion with, with some of the colleagues who are listed here. That's great. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that Paul. Uh, now, uh, as you mentioned, I'm very lucky to be joined by a, an excellent panel this evening. Um, and it kind of spans the, the academic and the clinical members of the consortium and also the geographical spread of the, uh, across the country. Uh, so I've introduced Paul already. Uh, I'm going to take the chance to uh, give a little biography of the, the members of the panel. Um, Dr. Kate Reddington is a, a lecturer and a principal investigator from microbiology at NUI Galway. Her research group focuses on the development of innovative solutions for infectious disease diagnostics and public health microbiology. She's over 10 years experience in the development and translation of clinical diagnostics with a particular emphasis on respiratory tract infections. Kate's also a member of the HSE COVID-10 laboratory R&D products uh, solutions group. Dr. Patrick Stapleton is a consultant microbiologist in University Hospital Limerick and is the Microbiology COVID-19 Lead for UL Hospitals Group. He's also a member of the COVID-19 Expert Advisory Group within the Health Information and Quality Authority, uh, who advise an effort. Patrick graduated from the medical school at NUI Galway and undertook his initial training in Ireland, specialising in clinical microbiology. Uh, and then he embarked on clinical and research fellowships at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children. His special interests include whole genome sequencing of microbes to investigate outbreaks of respiratory pathogens, molecular diagnostics and microbiology and infections in people with cystic fibrosis. We're also joined by Dr. Fidelma Fitzpatrick, a senior lecturer at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and a consultant microbiologist in Beaumont Hospital, Dublin. Fidelma was the first national clinical lead for the prevention of healthcare associated infection and antimicrobial resistance. She established the national clinical program in this field. She led the national public information campaign on antibiotics, importantly for our discussion tonight, national hand hygiene and antimicrobial stewardship program. Um, Dr. Fitzpatrick is, a is the chair of the National Sepsis Governance Committee in the Health, Serv Health Services Executive the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Health Protection Surveillance Centre. Uh, Dr. Fiona Crispy graduated with a PhD in microbiology from University College Cork, uh, and she manages the next generation sequencing platform in Chagas Moor Park on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Fiona uses these new technologies to investigate human gut microbiology, 
its role in metabolic and mental health and its modulation by diet and exercise as well as the effects of functional foods and probiotics on human gut microbiology and metabolic disorders. So that's the panel. Um, and to get things started, I can see some people have, uh, have started to um, bring in some, uh, some questions. Um, so let me see as we go through. Uh, as we start off, um, I'm going to start off maybe with uh, Kate, because I think some of the, the, the guys there, you need to come off mute maybe uh, after the presentation. Um, we taught, or Paul spoke uh, during the presentation about the, the virus sequencing and targeting virus sequencing. Kate, can you explain how that's done for us, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, John. So in this um, consortium, as Paul said, we're all taking the same approach to sequencing this virus. And we're using Oxford Nanopore Technologies and a particular protocol called the Arctic Protocol. So it's a protocol that's been used for monitoring um, outbreaks of viruses such as Ebola previously. And it's a method that allows us to look at the unique fingerprint of this virus. So like humans, the virus has a, a very distinct fingerprint. And when it's, it's not visible to the naked eye, so we need to amplify that um, viral material. So similar to photocopying and making lots of copies of that. So by knowing certain regions in the genome, we can amplify the whole lot of that virus. So we can get a very good understanding of the sequence of the virus. And by doing it that way, we can monitor how this virus has um, changed over time. So we have samples from over the, the pandemic so far. So we'll be able to use this approach to generate um, very useful genetic fingerprints for each of the viruses that we're seeing. So that's the overall approach um, using a PCR tilling or a, a complete coverage of the genome. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so the, the technology, again, Paul had, uh, Paul had mentioned this, um, the Oxford Nanopore approach. Um, I suppose Fiona maybe is the person running one of the, the sequencers. Can you tell us anything about the, um, the technology itself, how it, uh, how it works? Yeah, sure. So as Kate said, the first step is to make copies of the genome. And we do that by copying small fragments of the genome. So small fragments covering the whole genome of the virus. And just to put this into context, like the human genome has something like 6.4 billion building blocks, the nucleotides that Paul referred to earlier. So DNA is made up of four different nucleotides that we call A, T, G and C. And these nucleotides are repeated over and over again in a random fashion, and that's your genetic code. The human genome, as I said, is 6.4 billion of these. This virus is only 30,000, so it's like so tiny in comparison. It's amazing that it can create such havoc. But basically, by copying small fragments of the virus, what we do then is that we sequence these small fragments on the ONT sequencer. So what happens is that these fragments are passed through a little pore in a membrane, and an electrical current is applied across the membrane. And as the DNA fragments are passed through, as each building block goes through the pore, it causes a change in the electrical conductivity across the membrane. And the software on the computer can detect that change. And each the change in the conductivity is proportional to the specific base or building block that passed through. So the A will give a different change to the T or the G or the C. And the software that's built into the computer can tell you whether it was an A that went through, then a G, then a T, then a C, and so on, and you get the code. So at the end, we get lots of little fragments with it. We have the genetic code of those. And then if they're pieced together like a jigsaw, basically. We can put all of those pieces together and make the whole viral genome from it. That's kind of basically what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question. Uh, different countries have shown different levels of infection. Uh, do these differences exist because of different strains uh, or different mutations in the virus? Or is it more likely that those differences are related to other factors, um, climate, genetics, the population, um, behavior? I might, bring, uh, I might maybe bring in uh, Patrick and, and, and Fidel Mill on that, maybe. Patrick, I think you're on mute. If... Hi. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to start for them? Or? Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, I suppose like that's the million dollar question. So if you look at how the virus is transmitted first, then you can understand 
why there's different factors that determine different transmission rates. So it's transmitted by respiratory droplets and also by hands and contact. So factors that facilitate that. So there's, there's a lot of stuff about our society and how we live and our population density and where we live that certainly will impact on different rates. Um, definitely differences in our um, healthcare systems and how we manage health and illness will impact on that. There's differences with us individually in different countries in terms of nutrition, our behavior. Um, so in a way, I, I was fascinated by that question because it is a bit of, at the moment, it's all of the above. So we, we know for definite that where you have people that cluster in collective living and are in close contact, that absolutely facilitates spread. Um, and then, of course, there is potentially differences in the virus. And then underlying all of this is this is a totally new virus. So none of us had any immunity at all. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to, to Patrick for the, the easy bit then to conclude that. that. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I, I, regarding strains, um, Paul had touched nicely in his presentation on um, one of the significant mutations that we think has um, uh, been successful during the pandemic, D614G, um, and that does seem to be associated with increased potentially infectivity um, and transmitting onto other people, but I'm not aware of any particular strains um, to date that have been associated with a worse outcome, um, uh, you know, more likely to result in hospitalization or, or death. Um, certainly what we have seen is, um, and again, Paul and the data presented from the NBRL, um, would, would back this up. Um, we have seen it evolve into multiple different strains um, in different countries across Europe, for instance. So when it came initially from Asia into Europe, um, we saw it evolving into strains in places like Spain, Italy, Austria, and the preliminary data in Ireland seems to echo what was seen in the UK, which was multiple importations. Um, but we have very uh, of different strains from across Europe, primarily rather than Asia. Um, we, we have very limited data on what's been going on within Ireland and hopefully as a result of this consortium um, uh, we will see what happened over the first few months of the pandemic and I would expect to see that um, multiple strains evolve within Ireland for instance uh, and, and some may get lucky so to speak and become more persistent maybe there's more opportunities to spread because as Fadema said they might have been in a congregated setting they might have been in a a workplace environment where they just got it managed to spread to hundreds of people and in a small space and became very successful but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're any more infectious or, um, uh, or that they're more harmful um, if an outbreak occurs in uh, for instance a residential care facility it's likely to be associated with more um, impact than if it occurs in a sports club um, but so when we when we see the data I expect to see many interesting uh, findings as regards strains but uh, and the presence of them and the numbers of them and where they're distributed but i'd be surprised if we see significant um, uh, associations with um, outcomes because the literature so far would suggest that that hasn't happened internationally thank you guys um some more questions coming in thank you uh we're, somebody is wondering what the sampling frame was for the 2,500 samples? Was it outbreaks, spread of community cases, hospitalized cases, cases etc., uh, or is it a snapshot of representative cases from over the country? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to take that one. Yes, do you want to take a Fiona? Yeah, I don't mind um, either of us. Uh, yeah, basically it was a snapshot from all over the country. We tried to and break it down geographically as much as we could. Um, so to try and get uh, the amount of cases from Dublin to reflect the amount of cases that are in Dublin and then Limerick, Cork, Galway, etc. It was another reason to try and get as many people um, 
around the country sequencing as possible as well and to get as many hospitals around the country. So we were getting samples from the NVRL, which are um, samples generally that were taken in the community. So they would have been taken all over the country and sent up there. And then we also have um, hospital samples from UHL, CUH, um, St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin, uh, Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. Um, and then as I said, the NVRL samples are, are taken from throughout the country. Thanks, Fiona. And kind of there's a follow up to that as well. Is um, why only sequence uh, the 2,500 samples, given that you can multiplex uh, so many samples uh, on a single flow cell. And how will these be selected? Um, I was supposed maybe Paul, maybe you take that one. Yeah. So I guess to some extent we're restricted by the the amount of funding. Um, in that we we want to do the job properly and accurately as well. So. Theoretically, from an academic point of view, it would be theoretically possible to include more samples on a flow cell. And obviously, the person asking that question is familiar with Oxford Nanopore Technologies. But that you run the risk then of um, false positives and uh, incorrect readouts. So I think it's a, we, we chose an approach, and again, this is the Arctic approach, which is consistent with that, with that which is used by the UK consortium. Uh, and really, it's the gold standard, and so we thought that best. I guess the other, there are other limitations anyway in that it, before the numbers started to increase recently, even though there, there were more than 2,500 samples out there, um, sometimes there isn't always enough cDNA left over in the hospital or in the, in the lab after the initial trial is carried out, or there is some other criteria in terms of the quality of the cDNA, which is limiting. So, but I think by virtue of establishing that we can do this, um, the potential then exists that if there is a desire to carry out sequencing on a larger scale, then the consortium already exists. We know how to operate. We're communicating with one another. Uh, everything is working smoothly. And should uh, the government or some other organization want us to scale up, we're in a position to do that at relatively short notice. I might just add to that, um, there was also um, a restriction in terms of the number of samples you can put on flow cells. So with the ONT sequencing, there were, um, when this project began, you could only multiplex um, a maximum of 24 samples. You now can uh, combine 96 samples on a flow cell, but actually if you, if you do combine 96, you wouldn't get enough sequencing reads to give you good coverage of the genome. So the most we're doing at a time is 48. So these SFI projects were supposed to be a rapid turnover, were supposed to be a short-term project, um, so the idea was that we were trying to be realistic about what we could achieve in the six month time frame as well. Thanks guys. Um, since we're talking about viral variants, somebody has asked if we could comment on that viral variant and how this might impact on vaccine efficacy. Uh, maybe Patrick, you were just talking about some of the strains, could you? Um, yeah, I suppose it's a good question and um, I suppose it depends as these vaccines come out. I think we need to have very close monitoring um, to see uh, if we see shifts in the types of virus strains that are out there. Um, if we extrapolate from things like um, the bug, the bacteria that causes pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumonia, um, we know that as we, um, as we vaccinate against particular strains or types, um, then we tend to drive the uh, frequency of those strains down, but there can be phenomena of strain replacement. Now, it's not exactly the same for um, the COVID vaccine that we hope to develop because we, we would assume that whatever vaccine is developed initially would um, uh, be um, efficacious against all the different sort of strains that are out there because really they don't have very significant differences between them. They do have these nucleotide differences that we can detect which are very useful for typing, but so far they seem to be, they all behave sort of as one. Um, I think we won't, we won't know until we see vaccines develop and know what um, you know what's, what what target those vaccines are using in terms of stimulating the um, the immune response of, of the, the people who take them um, and see that go into effect at a large scale uh, to see if that actually drives changes in the different strains that are out there uh, so that evolutionary pressure on the virus to to evolve into strains that might be able to escape from from um, the immunity induced by the vaccine. So a very interesting question and we will need to be monitoring closely. 
And it, it might be worth adding also that because there is such an effort and such a race to develop a vaccine that very many different approaches have been taken targeting different regions of the virus. So even if a mutation were to negatively impact on one vaccine, there would still be the hope that there's very many other options coming up behind as well. So that, that kind of leads nicely to the, to the next question. Uh, somebody's asked, realistically, when are we likely to have a working safe vaccine? Um, presumably it won't be before the US presidential election. No. <laughs> but, but it is interesting, isn't it? You know, it's, there's never been a time in the world when everybody has focused on one infection mm -hmm. and one goal. Um, so vaccine development is complicated and can be fraught with difficulties. Um, so I don't think it's going to happen before the presidential election, but with such worldwide focus and study and rigor, if it's ever going to happen, we've, we've got a much better chance of developing a vaccine for this than we have for lots of other infections. Um, but it is, it's not an easy thing. Um, it's fraught with difficulties even right to the end. Um, so we, we'll see. But, but I suppose that, if I may, that leads to one of my concerns is that we can't put our lives on hold waiting for vaccine. We have to be able to develop ways to live with this virus. And it's very difficult and it's very different. But if we keep holding out for vaccine, we're kind of putting a lot of our lives on hold. Um, so I, I think we have to, as, as individuals, um, try and work around this and modify our behaviours, which we, we are all doing anyway. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but I think the answer to that question, I, I chuckled when I saw it, was uh, no, but hopefully soon. <laughs> Um, I suppose it's kind of linked to uh, what uh, what we've been talking about, the genomes themselves. Somebody's asked, why is the mutation rate um, on SARS-CoV-2 so low when compared to other RNA viruses? Let's jump in. Well, I don't think we know for, for sure why it's lower than other RNA viruses, but RNA viruses have very different mm -hmm. mutation rates. Um, and I think at the moment we can just think we're, we're quite lucky that it is a low mutation rate because it allows us to understand the, the differences and the, the changes that are happening um, with a lot more scrutiny over a shorter period of time. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to. Maybe, I mean, again, we don't know, but the fact is that viruses want to be able to replicate and want to be able to spread. And this virus happens to be very good at that already. So there isn't an environmental pressure on it to mutate as much, would be my feeling. It's doing a very good job of spreading without having to mutate. Uh, and I would just add to that as well, that the coronaviruses as a group are extremely successful. So most coronaviruses are common cold viruses that we all get every winter. And um, I guess, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Like those, they're, they're extremely um, successful with their current strategy um, as evidenced by the fact that we all get them every year in terms of the common cold. Um, and so it's, it's just adopting a particular strategy, I guess, um, whereas for influenza constantly shifting uh, its, its genome structure and uh, by mutation and by other means like reassortment, uh, is successful for influenza and it means that we have to get a different vaccine every year for it. So there are different strategies that would be successful. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really valid. Patrick, the, the SARS-CoV-2 as well has, um, I think it's got a proofreading enzyme which allows it to correct for some errors, I think, during, during replication, which I think can have a different effect then when you compare mutation rates between some of the, um, between some of the viruses. Um, we have a uh, more of a clinical question. Uh, so it's uh, some medications are thought to be effective, um, for example, those that inhibit the bradykinin system or dexamethasone, um, latter dampens infl inflammation uh, and increases the production of uh, pro-resolution mediators. Is there any way to predict their effectiveness in different strains? I, I don't think there is yet. Um, we certainly are you, now using de dexamethasone 
routinely in the hospital um, for patients that require oxygen. And Beaumont is part of the solidarity trial, which my infectious diseases colleagues are leading, um, where patients um, are being given remdesivir, but it's very early yet to even to call that. So we don't have enough information in Ireland, which is the point of this project, um, on the sequences. Um, and this project won't address that because to address that, you'd need to be able to match your sequence data with your clinical database. And even with that, we haven't just got enough experience yet in using these drugs, certainly at individual hospital level and at national level yet. But we must remember this is a virus that was only really described in January um, and we're only in October. So we know so much more about the virus, about the sequences. Um, there's so much research coming out as a pandemic of publications at the moment, never mind the infection. Um, so I think time will tell, but it is, it's an important point and it's an, it beholds us all that when we're monitoring our patients to critically appraise our data constantly and keep in touch not only with the national community but the international community because our strength will be in our numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, somebody has asked, um, do sample collection and storage procedures impact on the quality of the sequencing material and, and how problematic uh, is this? Maybe Kate, I suppose from your diagnostics development side? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I suppose going back to where Paul outlined how the testing is currently done, um, when a swab is taking, it's taken, it's put into viral transport media usually. And that viral transport media really stabilizes the virus until we, we get it to the lab. And there's a lot of other things in that viral transport media, antibiotics and things like that, that prevent bacteria growth and kind of dominating that sample. So the virus is quite happy in that transport media until we get to the lysis stage. So as Paul mentioned, we lyse the material to release the RNA. So once that's lysed and released and purified, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a temperamental sample. So it's very important at that point that it's stored appropriately so that it's put into minus 80 um, until such time that we're doing the sequencing. Now we've been very fortunate to have um, great efforts with the NBRL here to ensure that we've gotten great samples and from the various different hospital sites. So everyone has been really aware of this going into the project. Um, so we haven't had issues with sample quality. Um, however, if you weren't very careful with that initial prep, um, yes, you could introduce biases and difficulties. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody's asked, is, is the sequencing preferable to antibody technology uh, to show which individuals have been, uh, have been infected? Um, so maybe Patrick, if I don't know from a, a clinical side of things on that. Do you want to, Patrick? Or? Sure, yeah. Um, I suppose to, just in terms of um, the sequencing, we're not using as a diagnostic tool more so to, to characterize uh, known infections. Um, but if, if the question is relating to, um, I suppose, diagnosis, the, the initial steps that Paul talked about in terms of PCR, which is the, the initial detection of not the entire genome, but we're just looking for a particular fragment of a gene that, uh, that is part of the, the SARS-CoV-2 gene, genome. Um, if we detect that there, then usually that means that what we're looking at is, is a, a, a recent infection or an active infection. And that tends to go away over time, although low levels of it can persist in the respiratory tract for up to 12 weeks in some cases. Um, so if you, if you get it, and particularly if we think that there's very, very high amounts of it there, and uh, even more so if it's associated with clinical symptoms uh, like fever, uh, cough, or maybe shortness of breath, then that would usually indicate an, an active or recent infection. Whereas the antibody response doesn't usually develop for at least two weeks in terms of IgG um, detectable in the serum. And so if you detect uh, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in the blood, um, usually that is reflective of a past infection some point more than two weeks ago um, and if the PCR tests taken from the nose swabs for instance or the nasopharyngeal and throat swabs are you don't detect any uh, DNA at the time that would sort of strengthen the argument that what you're looking at with a positive antibody test is something that occurred perhaps months ago. 
And I suppose isn't there interesting information on the Health Protection Surveillance Centre website on the National Antibody Study, um, which I think took samples of people in Dublin and Sligo, and a minority of people at that stage had antibodies. Um, but that also presupposes that your immunity is only based on antibody responses. So it's like everything we're saying here tonight, we're just beginning to learn a lot about this virus. But certainly a, a minority of people when they were um, sampled had um, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies present. But the, if people are interested, there's a nice report on the HPSC website. It's called Scopey the Project, as opposed to Scooby-Doo. Different. Um, I'm going to maybe start combining some of the questions. Uh, somebody has asked, uh, are we sequencing the host genome along with the virus for any correlation study? We are absolutely not doing that. That's not part of our, um, of our ethics. I know some of those kind of studies are taking place in other countries. I don't think that's taking place in Ireland, but I don't know for sure. Kind of a general shake of the head here. Yeah. Um, uh, and I asked the next question is, why does this virus affect individuals so differently? Um, do we know what influences whether a person is asymptomatic or not? Um, uh, and can this be uh, defined by the, the sequencing of the informatics? I can take a stab at that one. Um, one, of the, one of the key um, predictors, I suppose, of, of a clinical outcome is age. Um, it's not the only predictor, but it certainly is an important one. It has been since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as some of the things that we might expect to be associated with a worse outcome, like if somebody already has pre-existing lung disease. Um, but some of the interesting papers I've been reading about recently um, have been talking about how the immune system um, changes over time as we age. So um, young children who very, very rarely get um, sick with this, um, when they get SARS-CoV-2, um, have a... Uh, sort of a very strong what's called a nation immune response, which is kind of a um, undifferentiated, um, not very subtle immune response that's just trying to attack anything new um, in a general way because um, children are constantly exposed to, if a child who goes for a crash, constantly exposed to um, new pathogens all the time that their immune system has never seen before. And so they mount this generalized innate immune, immune response. And that seems to be quite good at clearing SARS-CoV-2 um, and uh, without giving sort of a, a, a adverse effects from that immune response that might damage the host, the host tissues like the lung in the case of some of the severe features we see. And then conversely, in older people, as we age, we tend to depend more on the adaptive immune response, which is extremely good in terms of um, recognizing pathogens we might have been exposed to before from a, a previous infection or even of a vaccination, the whole aim of vaccination. And we can, um, you know, with a, with a, with a uh, adaptive immune response to things like uh, quick production of antibodies as well as uh, other aspects of the immune response like Adema alluded to, that's extremely good at uh, clearing some types of infections like um, measles or mumps, uh, assuming that you have, uh, a, you know, your immune system recognizes the pathogen. But for some reason, it seems like um, that is not uh, a great response to mount against this virus. And uh, people who are getting older into their 70s and 80s um, tend to have a much stronger sort of adaptive type response than the innate response that children get. And that seems to be associated with some of the uh, poorer outcomes we are seeing in that group. Um, I am. Um Conscious of time, because we have an hour, a lot of we have a lot of people um, asking questions. Um, so on that basis, I'm going to try and go through some of those reasonably quickly uh, and keep going because people are taking the time to join us. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, could you detect influenza and SARS-CoV-2 in the same sample by sequencing? I was going to say yes, but until we got to the sequencing bit, so I hand over to Kate. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose from the sequencing point of Fiona, maybe you want to hop in here as well. Yeah. Um, Not with the approach we're using, but it could if you used um, if you tried to target fragments of the influenza genome, you could you could combine probably yeah to, to do it, um, but not at, not at the current method we're using. So 
as Kate said, it was developed for Ebola. It was changed to target this particular virus. It could be changed to target any virus. Um, and it's possible, I guess, that you could do two at one time, but it might be complicated. Yeah, I think there's two different things to factor in. We're doing it from sequencing the whole genome perspective. We're trying to get a lot of coverage of SARS-CoV-2. But from a diagnostic point, it's a very good question in that we do need to this winter be able to de detect and differentiate between influenza and SARS-CoV-2. And there are some tests out there that do that. Yes. And the technology we're using, there is another um, kit that can be used with the technology we're using, a LAMPOR, which is identifying different viruses in SARS-CoV-2. That's under evaluation in the UK at the moment in some hospitals. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let me see. Um, one of the questions that came up there was the, the strain circulating. Is it possible to predict uh, from where the virus entered in Ireland? Um, is it reconcilable to one event or multiple? Realistically, I think uh, it looks like uh, it looks like multiple events rather than a, a single introduction. Um, let me see. Uh, somebody has asked. Um, is there significant evidence yet to indicate whether prior infection with another coronavirus can afford us some immunity against SARS-CoV-2? I would say not, given that everybody has encountered a common cold at one stage or another. I think there's some, there's, I think there's hypotheses that perhaps populations in Southeast Asia might be exposed not to the common cold virus, not to the common cold viruses because as, as Paul says, that none of us are immune, uh, are mounting any, like we're not immune to SARS-CoV-2 and we've all had the cold. But there's there's theories that people in Southeast Asia have been exposed to um, other coronaviruses that um, come from the animal population like bats, um, as we think perhaps SARS-CoV-2 came from, and that that sort of, they may therefore have an immune response that might um, give them some degree of protection against SARS-CoV-2, because there's certainly very low levels of infection in places like Vietnam, and part of that is ascribable to excellent public health interventions. Um, but there's there's those, those seem to be uh, differences in the population's um, susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. Um, but it's it, it's a it's a hypothesis rather than anything that's that's conclusive. Okay. Okay. Um, I suppose another technical question. Uh, when sequencing the the 2,500 samples, did you select samples with a specific CN or? CT or CQ value, um, uh, and what value gave the best sequencing results? Maybe Fiona, you might want to jump in on that one. Yeah, I can't say. We chose a range, but we did try to exclude really high CT or CN values. Um, we didn't at the start, but we found that those samples tend to, to fail sequencing or give really poor quality results. And in consultation with the UK consortium who had started ahead of us, um, they said that they found anything that had a very high CT, CQ, CN, depending on the machine you use, it's the same thing, basically a, a, basically a weak positive, um, that those tended to give very poor sequencing results. It could be just um, that there wasn't very much of the, the virus um, isolated, viral RNA isolated, um, or that, as Kate said, the, the RNA was um, not in good condition when we got it, one or the other. So for the benefit of the non-experts, the, the lower the CT value, the more virus is there, or the more RNA yeah. is there. Yeah, that, that's, that means that you're detecting it earlier in your assay that Paul talked about. Um, so a low value means it's, it's picked up quickly, it's, it's like a time frame. Um, so the, the lower the value, the better, or the, high, the, the more positive the result. Uh, it's probably worth saying as well, when, from a technical side, when we talk about coverage, we're looking at sequencing the whole genome. So when we have those uh, poorer quality samples, we might get good sequence here and good sequence here and good sequence there, but it's not what we regard as, as a good high quality assembled genome. So um, that makes it less useful for tracking purposes and therefore it's, it's not as worthwhile to, to sequence it. It's like having a jigsaw with pieces of the jigsaw yeah. missing. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, regarding medication for the infection, um, what do you know about the the Regeneron antibody cocktail um, that was uh, that was used for President Trump recently? Do we know how an effective approach uh, like that is? Maybe Fidel might want to to come in on some of the clinical side of it. I haven't seen any published data. There was a press release, okay, and there may be a preprint, but I haven't seen any published data yet about that. 
understand. Somebody has asked, uh, will metagenomic sequencing be performed in the samples? Um, or will all samples be targeted at amplicon base? In our case, we're sequencing the virus. There are other projects in Ireland that will look at uh, metagenomes of um, patients who've been infected with, uh, with the virus. Um, we see uh, I'm very conscious of time, uh, and even though we have uh, a lot more questions, maybe maybe we'll limit it to the to the last few now, and we'll see if we can um, we can and answer some of the rest of them and uh, and circulate those questions back to uh, to people who are um, in the audience later on. Um, let me see. Uh, will the consortium go on sequencing samples until the pandemic ends? Is one of the questions. Yes, we'll keep on sequencing until we've used up all of the associated consumables and, and try to get our, our, as much um, value out of the funding we received. And then we'll see whether there's an enthusiasm for, for providing other funding or if the, the results that we generate um, encourage further funding to come. So as long as we can continue to buy consumables, we'll continue to, to do that. The initial grant does end quite soon. And so we'll try to extend that because we haven't quite used all of the money yet. But beyond that, I guess it'll be up to funding agencies or us to try to secure additional funding. And as I mentioned earlier, we're really being as cost effective with this as possible. We're only purchasing the, the consumables and the reagents, some of which we're getting at reduced prices from some of the companies and all of the equipment and um, the, the researcher time and so on and so forth is all being provided free of charge. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, somebody has asked about uh, how similar SARS-2 is to all the known coronaviruses, um, just conscious of time very briefly. Um, we know that it's very similar to ones that you see uh, circulating in bats in particular. So those are the likely reservoir for um, a jump of the virus from infecting bats to, uh, to infecting humans. So. Um, unlike some of the conspiracy theories you might hear, uh, this was not concocted in a, in a, in a, in a laboratory somewhere. Um, uh, somebody asked, is there a general region that the vaccine is targeting, like a spike protein or anything like that? Do we, do we have access to that information? Because some of it's probably commercially sensitive, I imagine. I think there are so many vaccines in development, they're targeting lots of different regions. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, okay, and maybe uh, one last question to uh, finish on, um, or maybe there's quite a few still there. So what we'll try and do is we'll try and answer those, um, and we'll, we'll get back to you afterwards on those. I think um, I don't know if uh, if anybody wanted to maybe close. Uh, Fidelma had spoken briefly about the maybe the efforts we can all make uh, around the virus and the, the trying to inhibit transmission and stuff like that. I don't know if anybody wants to. Uh, Add, uh, add to that as we uh, as we close up. Could I kick off? Um, because I think we're living in unprecedented times, and it's fantastic we get the support from SFI and that we're working collaboratively. But nothing will work without each of us as individuals doing stuff. Um, and definitely, if you're eligible for the flu vaccine this year, or if you've got children, get the flu vaccine. And from chatting to my colleagues that are GPs and just from chatting to people, I don't think everybody realizes that if you've been tested for COVID or even if somebody in your household has been tested for COVID, you have to restrict your movements. And I think that's certainly something that everybody can do to help. There's been a few people that when we phoned with the results, they either have been out for a wander or haven't really twigged the fact that they should be staying put. So I think if everybody, um, in addition to hand hygiene and wearing masks and doing social distancing, realize that if you're tested for COVID, self-restrict. If anybody in the house has been tested for COVID, self-restrict. And if you're told you're a close contact, self-restrict your movements for 14 days because that means you might be getting the virus, even if the PCR tests are negative. You have to stay in for 14 days because most people develop symptoms about day eight, but some people it takes day 13, day 14. So from my end, there are really practical things that I feel that if the world feels like it's falling apart, sometimes it's, it's nice to know that there's concrete things you can do to help. And I'm convinced that if everybody does a few small things, we can all collectively 
help each other. And certainly for those that, of us that work in hospitals, we really do appreciate it because it does make a difference. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's probably a, a good message to finish on. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. I'd like to thank Sal for their, uh, their engagement, obviously their involvement in the consortium. Um, take care, everybody. Wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all.